In this second video on fiscal policy, we're going to start exploring some more of the relevant key terms involved in the topic of fiscal policy. So on the screen there for you is a list of the main key terms, and we're going to take a look at some of those individually in just a moment. At this point, it's worth pointing out that those that appear in italics in blue are concepts that you're more likely to meet in year 13 in the second year of your A-level course, but it's worth sometimes just thinking ahead a little bit. So that's that's why we've included them. You've got space in your handout to uh, jot these down. So you've got some notes on the topic. Let's take a look at some of them in turn. So starting there with a budget deficit, which we sometimes also call a fiscal deficit. <coughs> A budget deficit occurs when government spending is greater than tax revenue, so that government is spending more than it earns in tax. The word deficit simply means uh, when we are short of something. So in this case, we have a budget deficit. Direct tax is any tax on income, profits and wealth. It's paid directly out of the bearer's income to the tax authorities. That contrasts with indirect tax which is a tax on spending, for example, VAT or excise duties on items such as cigarettes, alcohol and petrol. These are paid uh, to the tax authorities, not by the consumer themselves, but indirectly by the suppliers of the goods or services. The national debt, which we sometimes call public sector debt or government debt, is the total amount owed by the government. In effect, that's an accumulation, the adding up of all of the previous year's budget deficit. Now, two of the additional key terms that I said are really more relevant in year 13, but we might as well take a look here. They're just highlighted on the screen there for you. Um, and they are cyclical fiscal deficit and structural fiscal deficit. So these are two of the main reasons or causes of fiscal deficits. The first cause of fiscal deficit is the cyclical cause. Um, and this is where the size of the deficit is directly influenced by the state of the economy. So, for example, in an economic boom, when GDP is rising, we tend to find that the government um, tax receipts are quite high because people have quite high income, so they're paying more income tax. Businesses are very profitable, so they pay more corporation tax. Um, we go shopping more, so uh, more is gained in terms of VAT, for example. Uh, spending on um, the regular things that governments spend on, for example, benefits, tends to be lower. So we, in a boom, we tend to get a very small fiscal deficit or potentially even a surplus. At the bottom there, we have the idea of a structural fiscal deficit. And that's part of the overall budget deficit, which is not related to the state of the economy. It's to do with just specific choices made by a government about what to spend on that part of a deficit does not disappear when the economy recovers. So some key terms there worth bearing them in mind. So what do we use fiscal policy for? Well, first and foremost, it's about using uh, spending tax and borrowing to affect aggregate demand. You can see there it's one of the main components of aggregate demand, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So when we use fiscal policy, we can manipulate, we can actively manipulate the uh, level of aggregate demand. We can also use it to change the pattern of spending on goods and services. So for example, governments might choose to spend more money on things such as healthcare and encourage us to spend in certain areas. We can also use fiscal policy to redistribute income and wealth in our economy. And we can do that by, for example, changing tax rates on different levels of income. So, for example, you could increase the rate of income tax on high earners and increase the value and generosity of benefits to people who are low income households. It's also used as an instrument, um, an instrument of microeconomic intervention to correct for market failures. Uh, so, for example, we can put excise duties or taxes on goods such as cigarettes um, and alcohol, which generate negative externalities. It can be used uh, to provide uh, public goods, merit goods, goods that are good for us, goods with positive externalities. And it can also, as has been seen recently in the news, 
uh, it can be used to respond to economic shocks. It's worth being aware, as we saw back in the first video for this online lesson, that changes in fiscal policy can affect aggregate demand, but of course they can sometimes also affect aggregate supply. So little test here, just to see whether you've remembered the key terms from earlier in this video. On the left hand side of the screen, you have some key terms. A friend of yours has decided to make some notes on fiscal policy definitions, but hopefully you've been able to see that they've made a few mistakes. Your task is to make sure that each term is matched to its correct definition. So pause the video at this point, take as long as you need to do that, and then you can restart the video and check your answers against mine. Here we go. The correct answers are now on screen. So just take a moment to check your answers against mine. And just a few more key terms, lots of key terms in this video. Progressive tax, regressive tax, and a proportional tax. Now you might have met these terms in your microeconomics when you've been looking at how to tackle market failure. Here's just a quick review. Progressive tax is a tax that takes a higher proportion of income as income rises. The example we've got there is to do with income tax in the UK. And just take a moment to read through the various tax bands. Regressive tax is a tax that takes a higher proportion of income as your income falls. So a good example there would be VAT. And again, just take a moment to read through the numerical example on the screen. Finally, a proportional tax. This is a tax that takes the same proportion of income regardless of the level of income. And the example that we've popped down there for you is that some uh, of the US states have a proportional income tax on their citizens. Uh, Utah, Colorado are two of them. There are around seven or eight US states that do that. Just applying that, UK taxes, uh, direct taxes, are mostly progressive taxes. And it's really worth just taking a moment to stop and, and really look at that diagram, the chart that's on the screen there. This is direct taxes as a proportion of total household income. The latest data available on this is 2017-2018. And what we've done here is split the population into quintile groups. So. In effect, to, to do that, what you do is you effectively line up individuals along that x-axis. On the left-hand side of the x-axis are the poorest 20% of households. The second quintile is the next 20%, all the way through to that fifth quintile, the top quintile. These are the 20% of households with the highest income. And what you can see is that the proportion of direct taxes, um, sorry, direct taxes as a proportion of household income rises from the bottom left up to the top right in total. But take a moment to think, is there any evidence in this chart that some direct taxes are regressive? Well, income tax, the bottom dark green uh, band is definitely progressive. That definitely takes a higher proportion of income as we move through the quintiles. National insurance, which is effectively another sort of income tax, uh, but goes directly towards paying uh, for things like benefits, such as pensions um, and job seekers allowance. That is clearly progressive for the bottom four quintiles. You can see that band getting bigger, but actually it's smaller for the top quintile and that might well be that actually uh, people in the top quintile aren't necessarily employees maybe they are more like employers they don't get paid um, in a regular salary perhaps maybe they are more likely to be paid in other ways such as shares or through dividends for companies and so on the top uh, lighter green box is council tax and to me that very much looks like it is regressive so it places a higher burden on the bottom quintile compared to the top quintile. Let's take a look at indirect taxes now, and you can see the completely opposite pattern. They take a higher proportion of the income of the poor, that bottom quintile, compared to the top quintile. And if you like, just pause the video to take a few more moments to look at that chart in more detail. So. 
little task here. We looked at this a few moments ago, but just go online to find out the tax bans for income tax in the UK. They do change every year, so it's worth just keeping up to date with that. And it's also worth you just taking a look at the government website that highlights this. You'll find out all sorts of additional useful information. Here are the um, answers in slightly more detail, just for when you have found that already online.